So, hi everyone once again. My name is Maxim Miroshnichenko and I'm a guest from uh, a variety of different countries and primarily from uh, Kyrgyzstan, American University of Central Asia in Bishkek. And so today I will present some of... Uh, uh, I will try to briefly present some of the results of my activities in uh, Texas Tech University while being Fulbright Scholar under the supervision of Professor Bruce Clark. Uh, and I will talk about so-called second-order cybernetics from reflexivity to biocosmology. Uh, and it will be a presentation summarizing my current research activities in history of cybernetics and its relevance for uh, contemporary philosophical discourse. So, yeah, uh, before starting this all, uh, I was trying to, you know, to make some uh, insightful and engaging and simple example about the difference between first and second generations of cybernetics. And actually, I asked uh, ChatGPT to provide uh, an example of this one, and it provided this uh, example. So you have to imagine yourself... Uh, observing a dance, and while you observe different movements of the body and its choreo choreographic pa patterns and some movements and micro-movements and coordinations between different compartments of the body, you understand how this moving system works, you understand maybe the engineering or mechanical principles of the movements of these interacting bodies and compartments, but you observe the system as an outside observer. So this is what coincides with the attitude of the second order, cyber, uh, first order cybernetics. So you observe the observed system. But if we make uh, a step further, we can consider ourselves to be the part of the observed movement and observe ourselves moving our body, moving different parts of our body or feeling the coordinations between the organs in space and some micro gestures which constitute this overall picture of movement. And in this, in this situation, you observe yourselves as a moving system. So basically, the distinction between first and second cybernetics is the distinction between observed systems and observing systems, which implies different epistemological movements, which means that in first cybernetics, you observe the system in objective terms and you are not yourself the observed system, while in second order cybernetics you are yourself the system which observes other systems and which is actually observed uh, in its turn by the system back. So actually, historically, these uh, uh, several periods of cybernetics coincide with some particular historical moments and uh, historical processes such as, for example, so-called Macy conferences, which were held in the United States in the age of the 1940s. Uh, and this is what actually provides the basis for cybernetics as an interdisciplinary international uh, scientific movement uh, with such people as Norbert Wiener or Warren McCulloch and other computer scientists, mathematicians and engineers as participants. And actually, first order cybernetics, by definition, is an exploration of mechanisms of self-organization and purposeful behavior in self-regulating machines, living organisms, and society, so-called observed systems. And actually, you can find the similar uh, definitions in uh, the book by Norbert Wiener, uh, Cybernetics or, uh, or Mechanisms in uh, Human and machine or something like that. I'm sorry, I can't remember it. While second order cybernetics uh, add, adds additional, so to say, epistemological layer to all this discourse because it adds reflexivity. And reflexivity is important here because it, because it can be uh, defined as the capability of self-application. So while you being a cybernetician describe some particular technical system or living organism uh, maintaining the second order epistemological move, a gesture, you should understand that you are yourself the system which can be described in the same way in which you describe the observed system. So you, you, um, you, not, you do not simply describe some technical object uh, 
but you are yourself the object which can be described using the same, the very same framework and the very same conceptual apparatus to, uh, to observe your own experiences, for example. That's why uh, people from second-order cybernetics call it the cybernetics of observing systems. And uh, such a, uh, an important and even cult figure as Heinz von Furster, uh, actually he, he coined the term second-order cybernetics. He made many, you know, kind of very ambiguous and mysterious aphorisms about uh, the epistemological position of second-order cybernetician. And, for example, he said that I am the observed relation between myself and observing myself. And actually, uh, the idea of ego, the idea of subject, is kind of one of the basic uh, examples and instances of these second-order movements, because you observe yourself uh, as an observer of your own inner experiences, which can be observed by uh, some other observer who is also observed by my experiences, etc., etc. So it always implies some kind of sophisticated, reflexive, and recursive movements of self applicability and these, you know, endless circles of uh, uh, references. So actually, uh, this interest in uh, second order processes or reflexive processes was coined by. German social theorist called Niklas Luhmann in the 1990s, and actually he claimed that uh, natural sciences beginning from the early 70s made so-called reflexive turn, because different disciplines from physics to biology became self-reflexive, because they became concerned with objects that can observe themselves which actually adds uh, more complexity to our understanding of social phenomena, for example, and supposedly can allow us to analyze natural, cultural, social, and political processes using very similar theoretical frameworks. So no division between nature and culture, as many philosophers say. And supposedly, this systemic and cybernetic approach can allow us to make these movements and to uh, change our attitude to social and natural phenomena. And actually, historically, this research and reflexivity can be traced back to uh, 1974, at least according to uh, Stuart Ampleby, uh, who provided his one of one of the few attempts to historically, uh, you know, locate this uh, idea of second order and self applicable uh, conceptual uh, co concepts. And actually, he refers to several people, for example, to Heinz von Furster, who actually is proclaimed to be the pioneer of these studies. But among many other people, including George Soros, for example, as a founder of reflexive theory in economics and uh, decision-making, he also mentions uh, a person called Vladimir Lefebvre, who actually is a very, was a weird guy because he was an interdisciplinary scholar of Soviet origin, uh, who made a kind of important contribution to uh, Soviet version of uh, game theory, which was called reflexive game theory. He uh, consulted some military agencies in Soviet Union and the United States. And after his emigration to the U.S., he was employed at uh, California University in Irvine in 1973. And there he uh, developed his ideas about First of all, cybernetic approaches to ethical cognition. Secondly, uh, formalized approach to reflexivity as the basic capability of uh, human and non-human cognitive systems. And automated decision-making using the formal apparatus which he invented uh, and, uh, and was developing during his scientific career. And actually, uh, he provided you know, very, kind of very eclectic and very sophisticated system which can be claimed to be philosophical or mathematical or cybernetic because <clears throat> actually his own knowledge of the international cybernetic context context was very limited because he was no actually uh, no uh, no texts of western cybernetics available for him uh, when he was young in the 1960s and he uh, experienced some oppression from the uh, so academic mainstream, especially when he was working in the classified military aid institutions, but still he developed a very sophisticated theory of self-applicable processes, reflexivity, decision-making, 
and actually these ideas were uh, used by him not only in psychology for example but in some uh, as he said cosmological uh, conceptualizations which are actually metaphysical in philosophical meaning of this term and actually he began his scientific activities in engineering psychology when he analyzed human machine interactions and humans place in technical systems uh, which eventually led him to the studies of conflicting behavior in psychological and strategic theory uh, framework. So in the 1960s, he participated in discussion within the Moscow methodological circle, and actually after very severe debates about uh, the place of reflection and reflexivity, he introduced and he really forced this community to introduce the concepts of reflection, reflexive system, reflexive process, subject, consciousness, awareness, and the like. Because people around Shedrovitsky, they were not inclined to use any, you know, any concepts which refer to the idea subject or human because they try to provide more, well, abstract or how to say uh, conceptions of agency and cognition. But Lefebvre uh, provided some mathematical uh, evidence for this and he pursued uh, persuaded these people to uh, introduce uh, these concepts in the in the their methodological uh, discussions and actually uh, during these discussions he provided some mathematical formalism uh, formalisms which were intended to be the ways of objectivation of thinking and introducing the subjects of reflection in a scientifically valid uh, and evidential uh, style so to speak because the subjects of reflection he introduced were individuals groups organizations states and so on and so forth and actually uh one of the few uh how to say were brief historical uh, survey here because in 1962 at least according to the memories of here's uh, con contemporaries uh he, for the first time, he provided the image of some small human holding the sketch pad with the image of their doppelganger. And in 1962, he began his research in uh, reflexivity. And it resulted in a series of publications. For example, and just men I mentioned uh, a few of the crucial ones. For example, in 1965, he published a short paper called On Self-Organizing and self Reflexive Systems in which he actually provided, uh, he, based on some metaphysical considerations about the roles of called constructor in constructing self-organizing systems, he also provided the hypothesis of emergence of individual consciousness and awareness from group coordination and interaction between the individuals in a small social system. After that, he uh, published Elements of Reflexive Games Logic, where the first formulation of reflexive control theory was provided, that is, the transmission of decision-making basis to the adversary. Uh, and in 1967, uh, it was a culmination, actually, of his first uh, stage of his scientific work. Uh, a book called The Conflicting Structures was published, which summarized his idea of reflexivity, reflexive games, and some cosmological meditations about the place of reflexivity and recursivity in natural history, so to speak. And in, uh, 10 years later, 1977, uh, an English translation of these conflicted structures uh, was made with a foreword by uh, Anatole Rappaport, a Canadian uh, psychologist and cybernetician of a Jewish Ukrainian heritage. And actually, this book was uh, published in English under the title the structure of awareness, and interesting, interestingly enough, uh, while in this, uh, while being published in the Soviet Union, this book was uh, pr was presented as a psychological theory of conflicting behavior. That is uh, the situation when I need to outsmart my partner and communication, or to persuade to make them something uh, important for me. While in the English translation. With minor changes, this book was presented as a systematic and unifying theory of consciousness using mathematical framework. So weirdly enough, it provided some changes. So here I show a so-called cybernetic cube. And it, this is an illustration from his uh, 
paper which he presented in 1984 or something in the conference uh, in the conference section which uh, in which also Francisco Varela, Stuart Ampleby and uh, Ernst von Glaserfeld uh, were participating and during uh, in, in his paper at this conference he was talking about the differences and similarities between Western and Soviet cybernetics and actually Western and Soviet second order cybernetics. And actually here <coughs> he uh, attempted to make a systematic view of different branches of cybernetics using several axes, that is the uh, axis of structure, axis of computation and axis of reflection. Uh, and actually you see uh, on the different points of this cube you see different approaches such as algorithm theory, automaton, uh, automaton theory, algebra uh, and his own contribution uh, in contrast at least to epistemology of second order cybernetics which is uh, you can see on the point 001 uh, you can see reflexive analysis which is actually his the first entitlement of his research endeavors in the 1970s so the analysis of reflexive processes in uh, psychology and decision making but actually uh, the point 111 is the point of, in, uh, point of intersection of all these approaches which supposedly can unify epistemology of first and second order cybernetics and all these axes of computation reflection structure and he claimed uh, that two theories can be the unifying framework for all the uh, endeavor of cybernetics as a scientific discipline or meta discipline that is theory of autopoiesis by uh, Umberto Maturano and Francisco Varela and algebra of conscience and actually algebra of conscience is Lefebvre's later work from 1982 in which he uh, tried to analyze the differences between Western and Soviet ethical systems using Boolean algebra and just a few technical specificities of Boolean algebra that you can uh, change the me, uh, the logical operators and truth values in uh, the formulation without changing the logical status of these operators. So actually the idea of algebra of consciousness uh, is that two different ethical systems can be translated into each other's languages using simple uh, switches between the logical operators. So actually they are not so different. The difference is in truth values and interpretation of logical operations. And actually, he claimed that his idea of uh, consciousness, uh, algebra of conscience, as formalization of reflexive processes in ethics, can unify different aspects of overall cybernetics. So, uh, strangely enough, he, he successfully presented this uh, idea to his colleagues from Western cybernetics. They were kind of surprised. And, and actually, he even said that he was the pioneer of. Uh, investigating this recursive reflexive process which was strange because uh, actually the canonical version of uh, cybernetic history is that it was Heinz von Furster who invented this concept and who you know utilized these concepts in analyzing social processes and the like but if ever claimed to be the first and it was strange but actually uh, later I will show that this, from historical standpoint, this point is not so, you know, un, is not so strange because uh, he had some historical prerequisites for, for that. So just to outline his psychological theory and just a few uh, excursions, he criticized two dogmas of natural science, uh, which actually coincide with the cybernetic and behaviorist understanding of cognition is that the, the uh, first uh, dogma is that observer theory of an object is not the project product of the object's own agency and the second dogma is that the object is independent of the observer's theory of it which means that first of all the object awaits how they are to be discovered and explained and secondly that uh, it cannot be influenced by the uh, theory which describes the behavior so objects are staying apart from uh, our uh, investigatory activities but the problem is uh, that how can we describe the psychic objects how can we describe the objects which have intelligence for example and uh, 
One of the interesting aspects of this is the idea of social science is understood by Stuart Ampleby. That in social science, observers are participants. So it's, it's impossible not to participate in the phenomenon which you are describing when you are studying some social or cultural process. You always participate somehow to this process and change the, very, the way in which this process, uh, process uh, constitutes itself. And actually, in his dissertation from 1971, uh, uh, Lefebvre criticizes the cybernetic ide ideology, which for a while erased the distinction between human and machine. The human began to be considered as some entrance to the system or an information filter. This approach, despite its effectiveness, did not allow for taking into account one feature of human when solving some tasks. The human has a psyche. This factor could not be considered by the engineer after all, as a rule, the idea of the reality of mental phenomenology is alien to an engineer educated in modern times. And actually, his critical stance again against the modern uh, engineering and technical understanding of human uh, culture and nature was uh, so strong that in the 1990s and, to, and even in 2000s, he developed his own alternative epistemological conception of cosmology, of place of uh, mind in nature and stuff, and I will briefly touch upon in a, a later part of my presentation, but now I will go to his system, the uh, system theoretical reflections about how do we, how the engineers see the objects as systems. Because from the system theoretical framework, any kind of object and any kind of entity we are interacting with are systems. That is, they have some kind of organization. They, they have some kind of uh, constant structure. And actually, dissection of the same object uh, in different frameworks sees it as consisting of different elements. So, uh, the system of uh, so the compartments of which the object uh, consists uh, depends on our framework will we uh, lay upon this object. So. The observer needs to synthesize different projections or different views of the same object with a mathematical tool Lefebvre called configurator. So we can see the same object in different projections as consisting, for example, of different details or different physical processes or difficult, uh, different chemical reactions. And these were several views are different projections of the same object. But we need to unify these, uh, these projections. And the synthesis of these projections can be made with the mathematical operator called configurator. And configurator gives us the system of systemic projections. And the observer who is aware of this new position, of position of configuration, uh, is becoming reflexive of, of themselves as the scientific observer. Because they become, uh, they become aware of the existence of different projections of the same uh, object and unifying these several projections with their uh, view of themselves as making the synthesis provides us with so-called holistic configuration. So holistic configuration is the situation of uh, the observer which sees themselves as possessing this unity of different projections of the same object as system. And in this, uh, in this gesture, reflexivity becomes a part of observer's activity, which means that, first of all, it means that object considered a system is seen as system of systems, system of systemic representations. The observer as scientific investigator sees themselves as the system which can unify uh, different projections using the configurator. And with this, reflexivity becomes a crucial part of overall epistemic situation. And with this in mind, we can proceed with studying complex systems, that is, systems which have psyche, uh, according to Lefebvre. And these systems who have psyche are uh, comparable or superior in complexity to the observer. So the thing is that for Lefebvre, it is impossible to study systems which are as complex as, as observer is 
uh, using the first order cybernetics because we need some kind of alternative framework. And here you can see uh, the figure of the scientific observer who unifies different projections. You, you can see these projections A, B, and C of the same object. And configurator is this tool which unifies projections A, B, and C in some kind of unified structure. And with this in mind, uh, observer becomes reflexive of overall situation. So they become more, you know, more enlightened, so to speak. So actually, uh, reflection uh, was defined by Lefebvre as the ability to become the observer of one psyche and the psyche of the other. So you are capable of mirroring your own uh, mental process and the mental process of the other. So this definition is pretty wide because it involves not only reflection in traditional sense of uh, you know, psychological reflections or meditations or introspection or something like that, but also empathy to some extent and other psychological uh, processes and capabilities which somehow recognize the inner states of the other. And reflection always involves at least two, two psychic objects, two persons can observe themselves and observe the other's observation of themselves. So this is the game of interchange of positions between observer and observed. And the collective or social group emerges as community of subjects looking through each other's eyes, which is pretty similar actually to the definition by Hans von Furster uh, when he was uh, talking about uh, reality as community and many things like that, and I strongly recommend you to look through uh, von Furster's text about reflexivity and sociality because he made really deep, deep insights uh, into these um, issues. And uh, after that, after these basic, you know, epistemological uh, claims, if we ever proceeded to make a standardized formal language to describe the inner world of these psychic systems. Uh, synthesizing technical and introspective phenomenologies, according to his words, and he developed, at least in the 1970s, before his move to uh, formalization of ethics or cosmological meditations, he was developing so-called algebra of ref reflexive processes. That is the descriptions of series of reflexive acts of all participants to the social processes. So, these algebraic descriptions includes their own reflexive images in this description because the observer, even the mathematician who, you know, uh, provides these lines of symbols in a mathematical parlance is also the part of this process. So, so while you are writing these uh, mathematical for formalisms, you are yourself the parts of the formalisms which you are writing. Uh, so, uh, these formalisms had the form of uh, algebraic polynomials, which fixate the process of their own formation from the observer's standpoint. And there are several other uh, interesting aspects, and probably I will skip them, and I just show some of the basis of formalisms. So, to be honest, these formalisms are not the final results of his work, because uh, this is... Uh, this is uh, a summary of his approach from the 1970s. In the 80s, he used different mathematical formalisms. In the 19s uh, and 2000s, he used a completely different uh, ways of, uh, you know, formalizing. So, basically, what 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 does it all mean? So, in this first formula, O equals T plus T X, uh, we can see reality reality from the standpoint of the observer, reality T, and its image Tx in persona X. So actually, uh, the reflexive system can be formalized in this way. So reflexive system equals reality and its image, and this reality's image in some person. We can add more reflexive layers, such as, for example, reality and its image in X, and the image of this image of X in Y. Uh, which involves two persons. Uh, the uh, third formalism, is in, uh, formalism involves three persons. So reality, its image in X, and its image in X from the standpoint of Y, and its image uh, 
and image in X in Y from Z position. So we can add a lot of reflexive uh, recursive uh, layers of description and basically uh, we can use even uh, you know pictures to uh, represent the same relationships because we can for example show that even the X uh, X has no direct uh, direct access to reality because X has, X has access to reality through Y's eyes for example while Y has the access to reality once again uh, through some other person's uh, standpoint, and so on and so forth. So we can add a lot of recursive layers there. Uh, we can have even more uh, sophisticated uh, relationships between persons. And um, the interesting thing here is that <clears throat> uh, Lefebvre was trying to formalize phenomenology, actually, because uh, when I interviewed his widow, uh, who is still living in California, uh, she was talking that Lefebvre was reading extensively different kinds of stuff, and including phenomenology and Russian cosmism, and basically he was very interested in how to formalize intentionality, uh, self-image of the subject, and different other psychological processes, and he actually borrowed some insights from phenomenology. And what I consider to be the most phenomenological in his endeavor is the idea of so-called so reflexive closure. Because when we use the algebraic formalisms to describe the structure of the subject, uh, he introduced so-called operators of awareness. Operators of awareness are uh, some uh, other formalisms which can, multiple, can be multiplied to the existing polynomials and provide some other descriptions. And actually, these operators are mathematical operators which describe the dynamics of changing of the psychic system. So while we fixate you know, uh, these formulas, we simply fixate the statics. So this is how X feels themselves right now. But if we want to add some dynamics, for example, how this state can change in time or how this state can be changed using, I don't know, some uh, phenomenological gestures such as uh, phenomenological reduction or something like that. We have to use, uh, sorry, we have to use some operators and they, this op the work of these operators means that I can be enclosed in my inner experience and can be limited by it. What does it mean? It means that, first of all, Consciousness is, can be defined by freedom uh, for Lefebvre. But Lefebvre said that mathematically we cannot describe freedom uh, as, an, as a scientific object. We can only uh, describe its limitations. And uh, these operators of awareness are actually the mathematical operators which delimit our freedom, delimit the freedom of the subject. And uh, these operators enclose the stream of experience in some particular structure. So, for example, he, uh, he provided several uh, operators of awareness and several uh, explications of their work. And one of them is, for example, the operator of the inner world. Uh, when for, when uh, the subject uh, is, becomes aware that they are enclosed in their own individual experience, that the only way how you can get the knowledge of your reality is only through your experience and you are enclosed inside the structure of your experience. Or for example, the operator of depersonalization, when you become, you're becoming aware that the only image of reality you have is the image uh, through the other's eyes. So you are enclosed in this relation with the other, which becomes the only mediator between your, yourself and your world, etc. And uh, I still wonder how to uh, how to utilize these operators in uh, more, you know, more precise phenomenological descriptions? Because he, Lefebvre has several uh, several students from USSR and from USA who uh, try to uh, use these operators of awareness in different situations. For example, some people try to <clears throat> describe the altered states of consciousness using these operators. Some people use it as 
uh, one of the method methodological insights to criticize social institutions and the like, but I still wonder how to uh, use this idea of reflexive closure. But the interesting thing is that this uh, idea of closure is, firstly, it's close to uh, actually phenomenological understanding of inner experience that it, it is, uh, as Ivan Thompson said, that my experience, my experience is ungo behindable, so I have no no exit from my experience. And secondly, it's very close to uh, uh, second order cybernetic idea of enclosedness inside your experience. So there are some invariant structures which predetermine your experiences and how you can explain and articulate them. So. This is what I think uh, is most uh, what's most interesting in a phenomenological uh, standpoint. But the last but not least thing which I want to talk about today is the idea of biogosmology. And this is a very preliminary sketch uh, because I, I was concentrating more on psychological aspects of his work and his contribution to international cybernetic movement. But in the 1990s, uh, something went wrong and he became a Russian cosmist and he uh, prepared a book called Cosmic Subject, which was published in Russian and then translated in English. And uh, one of the interesting things is that uh, the foreword to this book was written by Karl Popper and this foreword uh, makes an impression that Popper had no idea uh, what this book was about because this is a book actually about... Uh, it claims that there is some kind of universal structure of cognition which is unified with ethical decision making that is the decision between zero and one whether it be good and uh, good and bad or uh, good and evil something like that and this uh, this universal structure has mathematical formulation it's invariant in different physical and biological systems it's event and eventually uh, the electromagnetic activities of some cosmic objects, such as black holes or galaxies, can be formalized using the same uh, mathematical apparatus. And for Le Fever, it means that maybe some cosmic objects in distant space have some kinds of intelligence, and they make some kinds of ethical decision-making, and probably we humans someday will become these cosmic subjects. That is, uh, this disembodied intelligence uh, uh, forms of, of intelligence which, you know, uh, overcome the heat death of the universe. So something like that. Actually, these meditations are very close to classical Russian cosmism. And if you ever made explicit references to Nikolai Fedorov, to Tselkovsky, and other people from this uh, discourse. But interestingly enough, this idea was borrowed from his earlier book, from... Uh, uh, conflicts in structures from 1967 because even in this book he developed the idea of biocosmology. Biocosmology is a cybernetic worldview which implies the unity between uh, physical, biological, and psychic processes because they all somehow possess similar structure. And in this earlier earlier book he made a lot of attempts to using different examples to show this unity and interconnections between. Uh, atomic, uh, neurophysiological, and social psychological process using uh, different examples, using different uh, cases from game theory, from uh, uh, from ontological concepts, from from, from Perster and other cyberneticians. But uh, his ideas of uh, uh, unified configuration, holistic configuration, that is the system of systemic uh, projections. Uh, actually made a contribution to the uh, later idea of so-called ADOS navigator. Because in, in one of the earlier slides, uh, you saw the idea that... Uh, give me a second. Yeah. So we, ha we can uh, dissect the same object in different frameworks to different parts, and in different frameworks, the very same object can consist of different compartments, we need a configurator which will synthesize these different projections in uni unified framework. But later on, uh, in the <clears throat> 2000s, uh, he did this idea of ADOS Navigator, 
So Aegis Navigator is an ideal component of physical objects, which can unify different projections of the same object and navigate it in space in its trajectories of development. So it is kind of a very strange idea, and it's kind of naive Platonism, actually, but he used it as the basis for uh, even more mathematical formalisms, which he used to uh, unify thermodynamics, cybernetics, and uh, Russian cosmism in his idea that the task of the intelligence uh, is to, to make a big correction. And big correction is the overcoming of heat, of, uh, of, uh, heat death of the universe. And actually he said that, well, these two illustrations are from his uh, uh, earlier paper about uh, self-organizing, self-reflexive systems. And this illustration is from his later book on uh, uh, animality and the soul. And actually you see that uh, in the first picture, A is this configurator or, or constructor which navigates the object as a system, as unifying different parts and maintaining the structure as a unified object. While here, Aegis Navigator is the entity or component of the physical body which navigates this body as a, uh, as a unity in space, as a unity of physical thing, something like that. And actually, just to conclude, uh, he, this strange guy can be actually recognized as an important part of uh, international cybernetics, uh, even though he used very strange language, uh, which is difficult to translate into English because he, he has very limited knowledge of uh, international cybernetic context, but after his emigration to the United States, he really became uh, a contributor to many cybernetic uh, you know, intellectual movements in the United States, and he had a lot of uh, pupils and disciples, uh, and actually he, now he's considered to be one of the important figures for reflexive design in uh, methodology, uh, of uh, especially in social science, and many people from uh, I don't know from uh, modern second order cybernetics movements such as Stuart Ampleby or Alexander Rigler or Bruce Clark, my uh, current advisor, they all claim that Lefevre is an unrecognized figure uh, in cybernetics because he possessed such diverse uh, sources of influence and such diverse interests which can uh, help us to make some new contribution to the history of cybernetics and probably make a contribution to uh, some recent philosophical discussions because I think that uh, actually some of his views, especially uh, the view of recursivity uh, or self-applicability, first of all, they can be useful for uh, debates about uh, cybernetics in recent continental philosophy, because probably some of you know this book by Hong Kong philosopher Yu Kui about recursivity and contingency, uh, and probably some of you know the discussions about the post-human or inhuman, especially in the fields of artificial intelligence, because such people as Reza Nigoristani or Luciana Parisi, these people are utilizing a lot of concepts from cybernetics, algorithm theory, uh, machine learning, uh, automated decision making, and so on and so forth, but they all use it in the way of first order cybernetics, without reference to this self-applicability and uh, uh, psychological recursivity, which can provide completely different basis for even for inhuman uh, theorization of epistemology, ontology, and other fields of knowledge. So I consider it to be kind of promising to develop this project and I will be happy to get your feedback or questions. So that's it, I think. Thank you for your attention. Okay, I have two questions, I think. Um, one is, um, uh, when you said that um, uh, Lefebvre uh, draw this uh, difference uh, between Western cybernetics and 
Soviet cybernetics. Can there be a parallel drawn uh, between his work on, on the topic and what, let's say, Varela uh, did in embodied uh, um, embodied mind? When <clears throat> so that, that would be one question. And the second one, uh, I would go back to your very first slide. You opened with chat GPT. Uh, so I was kind of, that, that's, that's pretty subjective. I was kind of expecting uh, something more about uh, non-humans and uh, maybe human-machine relations. So the question related on the topic would be, um, how would you apply uh, Lefebvre's uh, reflexivity theories to modern day human machine relations? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, regarding the first question, actually, uh, first of all, the relations between, <clears throat> for example, Lefebvre and Varela are historical because they had private correspondence, and uh, currently I'm waiting for the people who have the right copyrights for this correspondence to share it with me. So historically, these people were in the same, you know, intellectual milieu because they were all reading each other, uh, discussing in conferences and the like. So they had uh, more or less constant uh, intellectual interchanges and discussions about the applicability of their uh, views and their hypothesis in different contexts. And what I do think is that, well, first of all, uh, the the most proximal uh, as aspect of contact between uh, Lefebvre and Varela is this paper about the difference between East, uh, between Soviet and Western cybernetics, because uh, Lefebvre said that there are several uh, theoretical projects which are close to his own understanding of second order cybernetics, and he mentioned a theory of autopoiesis, and especially in its earlier mathematical formulation of the uh, processes which self uh, autonomous processes which constitute themselves during the very gesture of uh, constitution and refer to Varela's work on bio, uh, out, well, how to say, biological aspects of autonomy. And in this book, Varela uh, basically provided the mathematical formalisms to describe the autonomous structures of living systems using mathematical apparatus without any reference actually to you know empirical evidence. And the mutual source uh, in, this, in this way for Varela and Lefebvre is so-called calculus of indications by uh, George Spencer Brown, this British mathematician he wo who was also a psychiatrist, somehow he was a pupil of uh, Ronald Lane, the founder of anti-psychiatry, who, uh, who wrote a book called Law of Forms, in which he tried to you know, to conceptualize the roots of algebra, the roots of Boolean algebra, which is kind of crucial for cybernetics and information theory. And uh, <clears throat> this calculus of indications was uh, basically one of the first instances, one of the first attempts to conceptualize this recursive and self-referational uh, self uh, process. And for Lefebvre uh, and Varela, Spencer Brown's calculus of indications was uh, one of the attempts to unify these uh, aspects of recursive concepts with reference to consciousness, that is to the process of uh, self-awareness, of uh, going back to your ego, to be present in the current moment, and all these kinds of phenomenological and meditational techniques. And I think that historically, uh, the most fruitful way to see uh, the connections between Varela and Lefebvre is to analyze their historical uh, heritage. That is uh, Spencer Brown in his calculus and probably Heinz von Furster because uh, when, when I, actually when, when I was writing my dissertation on phenomenology and inactivism, I was thinking that Varela uh, and Maturana and other inactivists and neurophenomenologists are original thinkers, but now after reading some papers by von Furster, I realized that 
they all are children or of uh, von Forster because he you know he provided in a very brief concise and aphorismic form he provided a lot of epistemological ideas which actually provided the basis for a lot of different approaches including constructivism inactivism you know all these uh, idealistic approaches but uh, von Forster was based on Spencer Brown and his uh, and his own uh, quantum physical experiments about the modeling of memory and neurophysiological systems. So uh, probably von Forster is the main figure for Varela in a sense. But uh, well, to conclude, I think that historical context is quite very important here. But I should say that in uh, uh, this later book uh, called Cosmic Subject. Lefebvre tried to formalize the processes which take place in inside the consciousness of uh, a person who meditates, and he uh, tried to for, to formalize using uh, thermodynamics and some reflexive polynomials the way how uh, consciousness works in two in two different traditions of meditation. That is the unifying with the absolute and uh, the unifying with nothingness. So these are two poles of kind of same psychic process which have some similarities with thermodynamics and he provided his own view of uh, these relations but actually he uh, also was basing on some interpretations of eastern philosophy which was provided by cyberneticians because uh, maybe you know that uh, while first order cyberneticians such as Wiener, McCulloch and other people were scientists uh, and the second uh, order cyber entities such as Heinz von Forster or Gregory Bateson or other people like that, they were all figures of American counterculture. They were all deeply interested in social reforms, in uh, Eastern philosophy, in different forms of Eastern spirituality, and in some alternative cultures, you know, all this kind of psychedelic revolution. It was all very close to them. It was all the parts of their uh, intellectual and cultural milieu and they it's all contributed to their own scientific activities so that's why they were all interested in eastern philosophy or in cosmism or in altered states of consciousness or in some you know what's now uh, nowadays called ecological activism so all these kinds of activities which try to change something whether in us ourselves or in society or in culture and the like Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this lecture, I would say. It's a very interesting topic. And, um, I have actually two questions. Uh, one question is um, about uh, the influence, um, le, 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 sorry, uh, the pronunciation of the surname probably is incorrect, Le Ferber had uh, on uh, the uh, Moscow uh, methodological circle and particular Shudravitsky school because it became later it became uh, very influential and the theory of reflexivity as far as I could understand became the practice for social uh, well I would say uh, for for social uh, for um, uh, management in their uh, social practices uh, and second question is well, uh, we know that uh, the uh, uh, cybernetics and particular Shannon's theory uh, was heavily used in in, um, in the topics of cybersecurity and particularly, for example, the uh, University of Monash, the group of researchers, they developed uh, a theory of information warfare uh, based on Shannon's understanding of uh, of cybernetics. Uh, were there any uh, consequences uh, for Le Ferver's theory uh, in terms of cy uh, cybersecurity topics and uh, uh, the uh, may maybe has it become kind of foundation for for any approach in in this uh, field? Thank you. Yeah. Uh... Well, I should say that he began his scientific activities uh, in the military uh, field because he was recommended for uh, scientific work after he published a paper on a small paper when he was kind of 
when he was studying at school or something, a uh, paper on automa uh, say, automatically prezel. So automatic, you know, uh, so automatic use of weaponry in an ulteriorly journal. And he was, uh, the, the thing is that uh, he was the only person without any, you know, military uh, status who published a paper in this, in this Soviet journal. So uh, he was recommended uh, to be a scholar uh, applying mathematical methods in military studies. And uh, actually, the idea of reflexive control, which, is, uh, w which was one of the imp uh, earlier uh, important components of his scientific activities, was an attempt to, first of all, to formalize the psychological aspects of interaction between conflicting uh, military agencies because you, for example, you can provide the wrong information about your intentions to your adversary to make them do something which might be helpful for you. So you can outsmart them or lie them or manipulate them somehow in order to uh, make something of it. And basically reflexive control is, th this is what reflexive control is about. So this is about strategy. And this idea was used uh, in, in military agencies and Lefebvre spent like 10 or something years working in some classified institution before he, he uh, went to Tsemi, the Central Economic Mathematical Institute, which uh, provided the computerized basis for, auto, uh, for plan economy uh, before his immigration to the US. But after he migrated to the United States, he also consulted some military agencies and you can uh, find some publications here and there in, uh, in English language media that some agencies still use reflexive control theory in their, uh, you know, in their media campaigns or something like that. So it still has some kind of applied aspect to this. But I suppose that reflexive control as, a, as one of the components of uh, the failure theory of reflexivity, it it's can, cannot be... You know, it's kind of an oversimplification of the overall fields of applicability of the theory. And I suppose that reflexive control is probably an important one, but not the crucial for understanding his overall intellectual development. And I know that in met methodological circle and in this uh, circle around Shedrovitsky and his disciples, Le Fever is called genius. Uh, there is really a cult of him as kind of saints. And it's, it's pretty strange because there is a journal called Reflexive Processes and Control in the Academy of Sciences, but it, is kind of, it's, it's, it all seems like a cult because literally they uh, take only those aspects of his theory which can be applied in uh, experimental psychology or military studies or management or, ec uh, or economics and simply ignore every, everything else. So it's kind of really problematic as a reception of his ideas because uh, when I was talking to Stuart Ampleby, he, he considers Lefebvre as a mediator between Western and Eastern cybernetics and uh, different approaches to cognition, decision-making, uh, governments and, and the like. And he sees uh, the Russian and post-Soviet receptions of uh, Lefebvre as pretty oversimplifying. So, I think that it's still an open question on how to interpret this heritage because certainly a methodological component is important as well as, I don't know, military or a strategic one. But I really think that uh, it's somehow misses the main point of his theory. this uh, deep immersion uh, to the history of cybernetics. Um, I have a question that probably can uh, facilitate our common understanding of uh, the first theory. Can you please uh, explicitly specify his notion of ethics? Ethics is the, uh, is the choice between uh, good or bad or it is uh, more so something more complicated uh, not uh, um, just similar to boolean algebra uh, like uh, are there any what is called sick terms uh, speaking in the words of bernard williams like uh, virtues like here are his seen his ethical uh, well view thank you 
uh, yeah, it's a it's a really problematic question because uh, somehow I was I'm dwelling into his work Algebra of Conscience only right now, uh, in which he attempts to formalize these two ethical systems of Soviet Union and the West. And in this work, uh, probably at least to my impression, ethics is really a choice between zero and one. So and you can interpret in in any way you you want it to because it can be a choice between good and evil or between I don't know uh, include or uh, in <laughs> EIO or uh, I, I don't know any kind of two poles and actually he do, he he doesn't say that this is kind of a discrete uh, relation between two you know strictly opponent entities like zero and one it's always about the degree and something but. Uh, in, in this work, there is really an understanding of ethical decision-making as the choice between two poles, zero and one, using some set of formal rules, which can be formalized with uh, Boolean algebra. And in a private correspondence with uh, mathematician uh, Luke Kaufman, uh, he said that the important, the, the crucial imp uh, component of this work, algebra of conscious, is not, is not that he you know, kind of provided this idea of reflexivity or something like that, but but simply a technical detail that he utilized the the so-called duality principle in Boolean algebra that you can switch between operators and and or and zero and one without changing the logical coherence of the formulation. So, two ethical systems, Soviet and Western, are based on the switch between plus and multiplication symbols and zero and one. So you simply change them and you have completely different ethics. So formally, almost nothing changes. We only change the, op the interpretation of operators. We change the symbols. So the difference is pretty superficial. But this superficial difference between ways of formalizing your conduct and your understanding of what is good and what is bad can influence the relations between these big cognitive systems that is Soviet society and American society. And for many people, like for Stuart Ampleby, this, uh, uh, these psychological and social consequences of these uh, switch, uh, switches between operators is uh, quite, uh, quite heuristic uh, in explaining, you know, inclinations towards conflicting or cooperating behavior in different social systems and social groups because you can even even google uh, lectures of ample b on management in which he he literally uh, gives the audience the, the questions from this book by Le fever and sees completely the the same you know the same percentage of people who answer in this or that way to the very same cases as Le fever had using his uh, for, for uh, formalized approaches so this mathematical model has some predictive capability, uh, at least to you know to the proponents of this theory. And well, in this sense, ethics. I I, I even don't know how to how to define ethics in a sense because it might be, maybe it's about following following some conventions or some rules. But the thing is that we don't know about the status of these uh, of these axioms, so to speak. We don't know whether they are you know pre-programmed in us uh, as some kind of software or they are kinds of platonic entities which can be embodied in some or other way inside us or this simply as a as is a formalized description of some particular historical situation i don't know because lefevre gives no hint about that he simply you know proceeds with formalization and that's it Thank you again. Uh, if I'm allowed to ask this a third question, uh, it will be related to the uh, late uh, that uh, late uh, late period of works by by uh, uh, about this uh, bio, 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 bio cosmology. Uh, well, uh, you've mentioned that it, it was 1990s period. 
Uh, and as far as I understand, um, well, the Soviet and later Russian school of um, uh, engineering, like space engineering, was heavily influenced by uh, by uh, cosmists, uh, the so-called cosm uh, cosmists, and they uh, tried to inherit some uh, some ideas from uh, from the early cosmism and later. Uh, have you uh, have you faced any uh, relation of the of this particular type of philosophy, this biocosmism, on later uh, engineering schools or schools that uh, that were developing uh, de de developing some technological uh, technological things for uh, for the space industry. Because uh, my, my, uh, let me explain. I'm asking because my personal experience uh, of working with engineers uh, uh, and uh, students in in the in the field, uh, they were definitely heavily influenced by cosmism. Uh, but I haven't heard uh, any any anything they were saying about uh, Leferver and he, he, his ideas. Yeah. Thank you. Uh... Well, I'm not sure about his uh, having any actual influence on, on uh, this current discourse on, uh, uh, you know, on astronautics and stuff. But I know that he published a paper in some astronomic journal with some Russian astronomer from in 90s about the mathematical analysis of uh, the activities of some distant uh, cosmic objects whether it be quasar or something, and they uh, they use his reflexive mathematics to describe the activities of this object. And uh, they made a hypothesis, you know, in a kind of this more than cosmological way of, uh, way of speaking, they made a very uh, speculative hypothesis that probably the activities of this object have some similarities with the activities of a cognitive system in a very, you know, speculative way. And this is the only... Uh, uh, well, how to say, natural scientific uh, ramification of his cosmic reflections. And I'm not sure that he really influenced the industry. But probably he, he can influence it in some indirect way because uh, his ideas of reflexivity are so important for, you know, for military and for all these people from government and policy sciences. And probably somehow uh, on some... Uh, non-evidential way he probably influenced this discourse but i'm not sure anyways he he made a lot of uh, explicit references in his uh, book uh, cosmic subject to tselkovsky to fedorov to some particular works of them so he really did read them and uh, borrowed some ideas from there hmm? referring to bogdanov's technology no nope. no no but he, he definitely know, know uh, Bogdanov's uh, contribution because uh, his circle of uh, reflexive scientists, especially in this journal, Reflex, Reflexive Process and Control, they had several special issues dedicated to Bogdanov's technology. So this is all very close, actually, because it's all kind of system-theoretic uh, cosmist uh, approaches to a variety of problems. So, mm, well, for me, it's, it's still kind of... Uh, you know, un un underdeveloped uh, part of my study, I mean, about his relations between cosmism, the relations between cosmism, psychology, and cybernetics, because uh, he made some superficial but important re references to Gaia hypothesis, to all this, you know, bio, geological, cosmological discourse in the 1970s in the United States, in his later work in 2000s. So it's all very interesting on. At least how he, you know, how he borrowed this, uh, these influences from his American uh, context. So whether, whether he was uh, involved in this discourse or not, or he simply was, you know, kind of observer of all that. So it's all about, you know, historical influences and uh, some probable uh, influences on him. Thank you. May I also ask a question? Well, thank you for your presentation and for, for the topic. Uh, so the question is the following. If, if we include ourselves in the system which we are trying to analyze, we basically cannot avoid the problem of subjectivity. So the world as, as I see it is not the world as you see. 
But in this case, how we can formalize our vision through mathematical formulas? Because what would be correct for me is not necessarily correct for you. So how this system is trying to solve this problem? Uh, <clears throat> this is a relevant question, but uh, the answer in Lefebvre and parlance is the same as in phenomenology. So we can fixate only the facts of reflexivity or facts of representation, not the adequacy. We cannot, we cannot evaluate if this image is correct or incorrect. We simply fixate the fact that it is the case, that I can see you and you can see me, and I don't know and you don't know if our images of each other are correct or incorrect, adequate or in inadequate. It's simply the fact. So the thing is that we can only describe the former relations. It's not about the contents of experience. And this is the thing. That's why he uses these functions uh, and, uh, you know, variables and constant because we cannot uh, fixate the contents of our experience so it's not about the problem of qualia for example it's more about the structure of awareness that's why the book is called in in this way i mean yes definitely our experiences of each other are different uh, the way i see you right now is not the way you see me uh, right now because of our positions in space and our ex personal experiences and the like but the thing is that, in fact, we can see each other in some in some sense. At least if we suppose that you are not my hallucinations and I'm not your hallucination. But I, I refer to Heinz von Forster for uh, re reply, reply to these, uh, you know, ske skeptical attitudes about uh, common uh, collective hallucination and all, all this kind of idealistic stuff. The only thing of reflexive analysis uh, which is relevant here is that we can only fixate the process of interactions and reflections uh, between subjects. And definitely uh, sub subjectivity is unavoidable here. But the thing is that he in that second order cybernetics introduces subjectivity, human you know, culture and all these reflexive phenomena in, in a cybernetics worldview. This is the thing, that subjectivity is unavoidable because we humans are making cybernetics and this is kind of you know it's kind of self-evident philosophical idea but for cybernetics is what was not so you know obvious uh, back in the 40s and 50s and it took several de decades before uh cybernetics became aware of its own you know dependence on on human cognition and human embodiment, for example, or cultural, historical aspects. So it's really needed the second order dimension to, to develop all this stuff. In this case, this, all of these mathematical formulas, they basically just explain the structure, but uh, they, they are not really very helpful in order to find any predictions about, about the future outcome of these interactions. Mm, no, because, no, it, it has some predictive, uh, the predictive capabilities because it's actually used in economics and psychology. So re reflexive control theory is really used uh, in scientific uh, scientific experiments and in social sciences. It's really used, but it's not about the contents contents of experience. It's about formal structure. Because well, more more common philosophical analogy is with Immanuel Kant. We do not analyze the context contents of experience. We analyze the structure of experience, conceptual structure of experience. It's not about how we feel it right now. Even phenomenology in Husserl and Merleau-Ponty, they are not dwelling into the you know the immediate uh, felt part of experience. It's not about that. It's about the flow of experience and its structure, its development in time. It's not about you know how I feel this very you know. This very color uh, or this very smile right now. It's not about that. Yeah. Hmm? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, now it's not not about history and relation to other philosophical names, but um, uh, about the. Uh, particular definition of complexity that uh, you've used in your presentation that basically the uh, complexity uh, is when the uh, observe uh, 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 when the observed uh, uh, phenomenon is more complex than the observer as far as I could understand uh, 
uh, but uh, is there any measure of complexity? Because, well, in, mathematic, in mathematical approach, we know that there is particular definition of complexity that, that uh, we, we can rely on. And here it's not clear if the uh, observer is observing something, well, we can, I, at least I think that we can always build, uh, fi find more and more complexity, like in uh, fractal theory, for example. <clears throat> we can just go deeper and the complexity will be uh, huge. But is there any approach to measure it in this approach? Yeah, it, this is really an important question, but the thing is that there is no objective measure of complexity because, well, how, how, uh, as, as Maturano said once, uh, everything said is said by an observer, and actually uh, what all, everything w which regards uh, second-order cybernetics is about what is said by an observer. So there is no objective measure of complexity, but the measure which, we, which can be used in reflexive analysis is the measure of the amount of reflexive layers. So how many reflexive, reflexive acts the system is capable of. So if it's more reflexive than you, then it's more complex. So, and basically, uh, in the beginning of, of uh, conflict in structures, Lefebvre makes some philosophical, you know, hints about it, but they're all, you know, kind of obs obscure because he says about the intensity of experiences which cannot be formalized or the measures of complexity which coincide with the in incapability of controlling it. So complex system is something which can outsmart me and which and which i cannot control somehow which is more free than i or which is more you know omniscient or something like that so in a sense this more this system which is more com complex than myself is kind of very mysterious because whether it's a social system or something else it's but is there any definition of winning like like in, in game theory winning losing uh, if the uh, if the system uh, outsmarts me what does it mean basically mm, it makes me behave in a way it wants me to be so it should be conscious always yeah uh-huh so be, being conscious or being uh, being conscious means being capable of lying uh -huh. in a sense. The, then can, can, can we say that uh, in this disposi disposition when we need uh, two, at least two uh, uh, actors, agents for, 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 for this reflexive process, one of them can be technical, like artificial intelligence? Yeah, why not? The problem is that, uh, well, Lefebvre began his scientific career uh, when defending his dissertation in psychology as an engineering psychologist. So because he was uh, talking about the place of human operator and human machine system. So he was talking about the place of human as the component of technical infrastructure and what is specific about the human being in this, you know, technical apparatus. What, what, what is definitive in human being? Is there any difference at all? And uh, in some places, he really says that, well, probably we can use it as a model for AI or something, but I'm not sure that even current uh, neural networks such as ChatGPT, I'm not sure that they are uh, reflexive in a sense in which Lefebvre implied it to be. And uh, in private correspondence with uh, Luke Kaufman, he explicitly said that any scenario of AI we can imagine right now is not second order. It's all based on, on first order, Tri trivial and linear understanding of systems. I mean, systems of input outputs and all this kind of stuff, predictable systems. Uh, but if we are talking about not the particular technical AI system, but the company that is developing an AI system, and does it have this level of it, uh, so socio-technical system? Um, I'm not sure I, I understand. Right well, well, we know that AI systems are reviewed and updated not by the AI. Currently, mm -hmm. they are reviewed, updated, and uh, developed by uh, by humans who basically take that reflective uh, position. Yeah, yeah, and this is the thing because uh, they are controlled by by engineers in a sense because they uh, they do not update their knowledge by themselves. 
but they even do not have any knowledge because uh, if you ask chat gpt about you know political questions for example uh they uh, uh they reply that i am a, te a text model i'm not a human being and stuff and i'm not biased in a sense but and uh, after that it provides uh, their answers so it's not reflective certainly but the thing is that it's a first sort of cybernetic system because it's completely controlled by humans in a sense and probably there is some eff effect of uh, unpredictability in its behaviors but it's kind of illusion because certainly it's uh it's replies its replies are based on what uh, is was included in it by human uh, engineers and developers thank you See, didn't get actually the answer to my first question yeah. and this one brought us back to it so this is what i was wondering because uh, again going back to your first slide uh, we um, and the slide where with the x and y and z mm -hmm. where you actually you see the you don't have direct uh, access to reality but you see the reality through the eyes of y or whatever um, so we saw the definition uh, and the difference between first and second order cybernetics uh, generated by chat gpt uh, and we saw uh, and understood this difference through the, the the eyes or through the view of um, chat gpt through non-human agent so can you kind of um, is there more from the paper basically that can be applied to this like human non-human relations uh, well, for me, it's still kind of open question, and um, <clears throat> interesting thing is that you can, uh, while making the, you know, the uh, asking something something from this uh, neural network, you can provide them a framework. For example, I uh, asked it to act like a philosopher, like a professional philosopher, and it can, you know, kind of play this character, but. It's not a character in the sense in which Lefebvre uh, understood character as the system which can be living or non-living, human or non-human, but it can interact with me in some meaningful way. And this meaningful way is that it has some intentions it, 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 and it doesn't, you know, depends on which these intentions are of psychic nature or of technical one. It's not about, you know, the way how it is embodied. It's about its, its behavior its teleology or its felt meanings or something like that but mm, it's it's really interesting for me how how uh, in this framework i mean in in this reflexive analysis how can we combine phenomenology in you know in a minimal formalized uh, meaning of this term with these post human or inhuman conceptions uh in in philosophy because certainly uh when he uh made this you know scientific basis for psychology lefevre explicitly sa said that i will analyze the structure of experience and abstracting from the contents of this experience so it's not about what i feel as a human being it's what it's about what my you know my cognitive structure m makes uh something like that and probably it implies that uh maybe these structures can be embodied in some different way so probably i don't know this glass if it had some some specific structure which can be unobserved by me as a human observer can outsmart me somehow and i even don't know about that i'm not sure so probably it's uh it's about different ways of description and different ways of uh, you know conceptualizing subjectivity and intentionality in a sense thank you yeah thank you Uh, I'm sorry, I was late and I missed the lecture and it's a, it's a bit weird to un ask the questions, uh, but um, here in the, this discussion I have a question about uh, this line of, of phenomenology and cybernetics, because it's for me it's, um, uh, I would say, an original way, because a lot of technicians now are like not the enemies of phenomenology, but I heard a lot of them saying that phenomenology is something like uh, old-fashioned um, um, thought and so on. And uh, this question about uh, subjectivity and um, uh, 
the relations and these uh, reflections that can be analyzed through these uh, theories. Um, just uh, you spoke about Husserl and Merleau-Ponty uh, and uh, what do you think that uh, Martin Heidegger's uh, like idea of uh, phenomenology and philosophy of techniques, if not concerning that often Heidegger is thought like an enemy of uh, techniques, um, but uh, I, I think it's it's like a very um, it's not a very uh, deep uh, understanding of what he thought and about this uh, subjectivity and uh, phenomenology because Heidegger's phenomenological idea was that not to start from subject but to start from intentionality as the first condition where subject finds himself from his birth. And I, I, what can you say? Is it like uh, controversial, or does it has some parallels to your topic? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, it's it's pretty sophisticated question because uh, nowadays these uh, ideas, at least Heidegger's idea that uh, cybernetics. Well, you probably know this, uh, the saying of him that cybernetics is metaphysics of the atomic age and stuff, which is quoted by uh, Jean-Pierre Dupuis, a French cybernetician who wrote an important book on history of cybernetics, in which he actually uh, makes many, many parallels between first cybernetics and phenomenology, because he's, he, he explicitly claims that these cyberneticians try to formalize intentionality and reflexivity as the main structures of consciousness and probably historically is not so you know precise not so well based but still it's a kind of interesting attempt so what should i say uh first of all uh what comes to my mind is that uh luciana parisi who is in no way a phenomenologist who is in no way you know a kind of a follower of these this line of thought of European philosophy, phenomenology, existential philosophy and stuff. She is a Deleuzean cultural theorist who writes about algorithms uh, becoming conscious of themselves and making decisions before even we are humans are becoming aware of them and things like that. So she bases her uh, conception uh, of all this stuff on this, uh, on this uh, pronouncement of Heidegger about cybernetics, metaphysics, and atomic age. So this is what's kind of uh, very interesting here. But I should say that uh, I'm not sure that I can, you know, I can get Heidegger's idea in, uh, in a literal way because uh, it's still obscure for me because uh, what I see similar with phenomenology in Heidegger's work is his earlier contributions, I mean, Bacon and Time and stuff, and not what he did after that. And mm, I'm aware of uh, very wide and influential criticism of AI based on uh, Heidegger's phenomenology, and you probably know this stuff of uh, Hubert Dreyfus and people from inactivism who are trying to utilize his Heideggerian arguments about incorporation of technologies in body and cyborg bodies and stuff. Uh, which is still made by inactivists in uh, some recent publications. But, uh, well, I think that Heidegger tried... What, what counters Heidegger from this cybernetic approach is that he tried to embrace, you know, the contentfulness of experience. I mean, these uh, delimitations of time and space, uh, which are made to individual subjectivity and its inner flow of consciousness using completely different, you know, way of cu cutting reality on parts begin because while well, phenomenology was saying about subject or body or, uh, I don't know, or community, Heidegger was saying about be, uh, being in the world and all these different ways of cutting reality on different parts. And for Lefevre, as cyberneticians, as for many other cyberneticians, the very gesture of cutting reality or experience into parts, into ontological, you know, entities such as subject or object, or I don't know, being in the world, or uh, I don't know, horizon, or coming to death, 
and stuff being towards death it's all problematic because it should be analyzed from this engineer perspective because whether we consider the world as consisting of i don't know entities or objects as in uh, i don't know as an object oriented ontology or as consisting of some uh, conscious uh, conscious subjectivities interrelating with each other as in different branches of phenomenology uh, they were a gesture of seeing the world as consisting of different parts some of which are important and some of which are not is uh, an engineering gesture and it should be analyzed critically it should be analyzed using the idea of configuration as uh, Lefebvre should say or some th system theorists uh, from the Soviet Union who were based on Lefebvre so in a sense I think that phenomenology and cybernetics are not you know mutually exclusive because even historically Heinz von Furster uh, uh, he uh, forced a meme that he was uh, that Ludwig Wittgenstein was his uncle and it was it was not true but he you know forced this idea and many people still think that they were relatives and they uh, they had deep communication with each other and von Furster was reading Heidegger a lot of uh, ma many times and uh, Furster had in many interviews Furster uh, tells something about Heidegger and his ideas and he said that Heidegger was right in the end uh, about uh, I, I mean being the world and the practical orientations of human being and many things like that so mm, I think it's rather a question of uh, of vocabularies and definitions probably then on some you know crucial and uh you know in incomprehensible uh philosophical differences between these approaches because in the end they are very close I mean, uh, second actually one, that was that was uh, what i wanted to know yes <laughs> yeah thank you Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your attention.